All right, good morning. It is a privilege to worship with you this morning and to study God's Word with you. And uh, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 18, um, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, one of the great themes of Luke is showing the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, the Son of Man who is despised and rejected among Israel, although He is Messiah, the he is Israel's Messiah, and He is the Savior of the world. It's unique because it has a bent towards the salvation unto the Gentiles, unto the, low, uh, unto the lowly. Uh, Christ came, the Messiah came, to seek and to save that which was lost. Even the Gentile, the Samaritan, and the outcast. We see that illustrated in our parable this morning. We'll look at Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, the parable of the widow and the unrighteous judge, and Jesus' teaching of the vital importance of prevailing prayer in our walk of faith, and the immense privilege that we have as the elect of God to beseech the righteous and just judge. I'll read the text this morning, and then we'll bow in prayer before we open. Acts, uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 1 through 8. Now he was telling them a parable to show them at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because of this widow, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? May God bless the reading of his word in our, our, our hour together. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we come before you and we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, your loving kindness. We thank you for the salvation that we have bound up in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, the Son of Man, who intercedes and has interceded on our behalf on the cross who has bore your justice due unto our sin. We thank you for your sovereign work and salvation. It is your work from beginning to end. There is nothing that we have to bring before you to deserve this great salvation that we have in Christ. We thank you that we can now boldly come to you in prayer through the person and work of your Son, who has paved a way, the only way to you, and has made us right before you. We thank you that we can boldly approach your throne and the throne of grace. And we pray for our nature, our nation during this time of great uncertainty and trial. Uh, we pray for this as we live and move within this wicked generation. We pray for our nation that you would grant the greatest gift, the gift of repentance, that you would turn the heart of, um, of, uh, of our nation to you in, in repentance. We pray for our president and our leaders. We pray for healing uh, for, for our president, if that be your will, and to strengthen him. We pray for wisdom, and we do pray that you would expose corruption where there is corruption, um, not only within our nation, but within the church, 
within our nation, uh, that we would repent and turn to you and look to you in all things. We thank you for the chapel. We pray for uh, your body within Believer's Chapel and the saints here this morning, that you would bless them with every blessing uh, that is bound up in Christ and that we would be encouraged in this hour to look to you and to not lose heart. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so we begin in verse 1 of this parable, and we see the purpose for which Jesus is, is teaching. Now he was telling them a parable to show them at all times that they ought to pray and not lose heart. And we have the purpose of the parable, the key to the parable in this opening introduction. To pray at all times, and number two, to not lose heart. Firstly, it is our Lord's command to pray at all times. It's not the first time that Luke has recorded Jesus' teaching on the vital importance and necessity of endurance in prayer and persistence. In Luke chapter 11, we see the parable of the persistent friend who's begging his friend after a journey for three loaves of bread. And it is written, because of his persistence, his friend gets up and gives him what he needs. This persistence, which can also mean impudence, an almost brazen or shameless persistence, almost audacious, a boldness. And that we see here in this widow as well, her boldness and her audacity to approach this judge time and time again, pleading with him. We see this command to persist in prayer as vital to our walk in faith. All throughout the scriptures, we see the psalmist beseeching the Lord day and night, we see that in the life of, in ministry of Moses and the prophets. In Ephesians 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 18, Paul writes, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we see Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We see this modeled in the early church. The church was devoted to prayer. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We also see this is what the apostles themselves were devoted to, when they appointed the seven, I guess you could say the seven first uh, 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 deacons, they devoted themselves in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, they devoted themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. One writer puts it in this way, in context of prayer for the Christian life. The soil in which the prayer of faith takes root is a life of unbroken communion with God, a life in which the windows of the soul are always open toward the city of rest. There is a time in which we are to set aside and pray, where we have a quiet hour, where we have a quiet heart, and we go quietly before the Lord in a quiet place. Uh, there is a time for that in which we beseech the throne of grace and devoted to prayer, quietly set aside, morning and evening. Uh, and yet, we are also to go as we pray, and pray as we go. It ought to be the bent of the mind of the believer, to have our mind set upward. Isaiah 26, 3, the steadfast of mind, you will keep in perfect peace, because he trusts in you. That's Colossians 3, verse 1. Set your mind. The idea is to continually set your mind on things above. And when our mind is pointed heavenward, our heart is seeking the Lord in prayer uh, as we go. And as we go, we pray. And we pray as we go. And so our Lord commands his disciples to pray at all times, to set their mind heavenward, Independence 
and in watchful faith. But not only does he command the Lord to pray at all times, but the second part of that is to an encouragement or a command to not lose heart in prayer, literally to not faint, to not grow weary in prayer, but rather to be devoted in prayer in the presence of God, the righteous and just judge, to persist and pers persevere in prayer and not to become discouraged or weary or faint. So why, why this second part? That's what we're prone to do, is it not? And the context here is uh, chapter 17. The context is also revisited in chapter 18, verse 7. And the context is Christ's return, the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, when the Son of Man will return as judge over all things and make right all things. He's instructing them in chapter 17 to be sober-minded, to not be carried away at every whim of claim and every false claim of his coming, and to be faithful. In Luke chapter 18, verse, uh, 17, verse 24, he says, For just like the, night, uh, just like the lighting, uh, just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man in his day be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He would later instruct his disciples in Luke chapter 21, verses uh, 34 through 36, to be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness, and the worries of life, so that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things which are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The necessity to pray at all times and to persist in do not lose heart is because Christ knew what the disciples would endure, that they would suffer and they would be rejected just as Christ himself was, would, re, would be rejected. And they would first see the fulfillment of the first advent. They would see the cross of Christ. And the cross would come before the crown in his second coming. And no doubt he knew the path of disciples would be a hard one. And they would perceive a delay in his second coming, in the Lord's second coming. They wouldn't understand it fully. And so it is with us today for 2,000 years. His return is imminent. And when he returns, it will be quickly, like the flash of lightning. But his timing is not our timing. And so we perceive delay and we perceive slowness. But not so with the Lord. And how prone we too are also too prone to grow weary and to lose heart in our walk and in our prayer. We get weighted down by the cares of this world, the worries of life. We get distracted and we are impatient. We are prone to impatience and easily discouraged when we perceive delay in God's promises. But his ways are higher than our ways and his timing is perfect. In all things, he is right. And so he instructs his disciples and encourages them and to illustrate to them the basis as to why they should pray at all times and not lose heart. The foundation of the command is illustrated here in the parable of the unjust and unrighteous judge and the widow. Verse 2, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God, and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God, nor respect man, yet because of this widow, because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. He introduces this judge in a certain city. 
He's characterized twice as one who does not fear God, nor does he respect man. In verse 2 and in verse 4, he even characterizes himself as such in the same way. One who does not fear God, nor respect man. He is morally and spiritually bankrupt, and he is utterly godless and devoid of care, of love, or love for his neighbor, or for those for whom he was placed to serve and protect. This is the unjust judge. Next, we are introduced to the widow in that city who had an an opponent and was seeking legal protection against her oppressor. A judge and the widow, two individuals starkly contrasting in their positions within society. The judge would have been among the most elevated in that society, in that city, the most noble within that city. And here we have a widow. She would have been the lowliest, among, numbered among the lowest and most helpless within that city. It's quite possible that the callousness, the scene of this callous corruption and abuse of power was all too familiar in that day in which Christ lived. The law set forth how Israel should treat widows and orphans and foreigners. And a judge was to be in place to ensure that they are treated justly and fairly. But the commentary here on the judge is the same commentary that Jesus speaks of, of the religious leaders and the rulers of that time, the scribes and the Pharisees who elevated themselves as rulers and experts of the law. In Luke chapter 11, we see Jesus condemn uh, these uh, scribes and Pharisees as having the appearance of outward cleanliness, but inwardly uh, they are full of robbery and wickedness. They had total disregard for justice and they had total disregard for the love of God and the love of their neighbor. They loved the chief seats and respectful greetings, but they were themselves like concealed tombs, like this judge here. In Luke chapter 20, he warns, Jesus warns, beware of the scribes. These are the experts of the law who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and the places of honor and banquets who devour widows' houses For the appearance's sake, offer long prayers. These will receive a greater condemnation. These rulers of Israel were literally devouring the the houses of widows. And here we see the judge morally and spiritually bankrupt. No love for God or man and utterly corrupt. And yet the widow persists in going to him and pleading with him to provide justice, to provide legal counsel. Verse 3, she kept coming to him. We see her boldness and even her desperation as if she had nowhere else to turn but to this callous judge as her only hope for relief. And he denies the widow justice for some period of time. Time and again, he denies her justice. When finally the widow wears him out, And finally, he says in verse four, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. The term wear me out is literally a physical blow to the eye. And this further highlights how wicked this judge is. The simple, routine, lawful request from a helpless widow who's utterly helpless, whom the judge has a legal obligation to protect, is nothing but a painful nuisance. She is so far beneath him, so worthless, that he equates her persistent plea for justice as a physical assault, a blow to the eye. And here is the judge, no doubt, he's built his career of disadvantaging others for the advantage of of himself or his own prosperity. He not only has no love for God or respect for for, for his fellow man, he shows utter disdain for both. 
This is how wicked this unjust and unrighteous judge is. And even he relents and gave way, gives way to the widow's pleas in her bold persistence. And he gives her legal protection, even a wicked judge such as this. Verse 6, here's where the parable shifts. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he not, will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. Here we see, unlike previous parables of comparison, this is a parable of contrast, a stark contrast, complete opposites. If an unrighteous judge, if an unrighteous, wicked judge will hear the persistence and beseeching of one whom he disdains, how much more will God, the righteous and just judge, readily hear the prayers of his elect? those for whom he has chosen and loves, for that is his very nature, his very character. And that is the very basis of the foundation, which enables the command, encourages the command to pray without ceasing, to pray at all times, and to not grow weary or lose heart. If this wicked judge responds, how much more will the righteous judge hear his elect. And that is the lesson here we see this morning. From an argument from the least, from the lesser to the greater. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over to us, how will he not also freely give us all things? This is the just judge in contrast. There are so many Old Testament allusions here in this parable. And I wonder if the disciples had in their mind, uh, if their mind raced to Deuteronomy, right? The, the greatest command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and to love your neighbor. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the other peoples, but because the Lord loved you. That is his love for the elect. The just judge in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statues, which I am commanding you today for your good. Verse 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 10, For the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice. For the orphan and the widow, he shows his love for the foreigner. That's the very character and nature of God towards his elect. He is, a right, he is righteous and just. He is all-knowing and all-loving. He is all-present. Nothing escapes him for the needs of his elect. His promises are certain, and he never changes are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground except uh, apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And there is no variation or shifting of shadow in him. He is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wound, wounds. This is God's nature and character. And this is how he deals with his elect. And we know that God causes all things for good for those who are called according, for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
A key theme in Luke, in the dealings with his elect, the key theme in Luke is to show the Son of Man. We see the, God's heart for the poor and needy, the helpless, in the person and work of, son, of his Son, Jesus Christ. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. All throughout the Gospel of Luke, and really the Gospels in itself, the person and work of Christ is bound up perfectly and wholly uh, the perfect nature and character of God in the Son of Man. <clears throat> Verse 8, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And he's pointing immediately to the second coming of Christ. But before the second advent must be accomplished, the first advent, which he shows in uh, chapter uh, 17, verse 25, 24 and 25. When he comes, it will be, it will be immediate. <clears throat> but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Before the second advent, first must come the first advent, the first coming of Christ, and it must be fulfilled. We see that prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. The, the work of Christ and his great intercession in which he mediates for sinful men. In Isaiah 53, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And one and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, spitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging, we are healed. And then down in chapter 53, Isaiah 53, verse 12, Therefore I allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. The suffering servant would first come, the Messiah would first come as the suffering servant to mediate and advocate for sinful men. That is what we have in Christ and his great intercession in the person and work of Christ on the cross. If anyone sins, 1 John 2, 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The widow had no advocate. How much more will God listen to us because we have a great advocate in the person and work of his son, his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, interceding for us, who took on himself and imputed our sin unto himself and imputed his righteousness to us. This is the first great intercession that God the Father would hand over his own son to bear the sins of sinful men for his elect. Second, we see an ongoing mediation in Christ, an ongoing intercession. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who dies. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ because he lives to intercede for us at the right hand of God. We see this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office.
But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood, a higher and permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. We sing the hymn, Arise, my soul, arise. Shake off your guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne, my surety stands. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is graven on his hands. He ever lives above for me to intercede. His all-redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. His blood atoned for every race, his blood atoned for every race, and sprinkles now the throne of grace. That is what we have if we are of the elect. We know we are of elect if we have, if we have been granted faith in Christ Jesus. This is what we have in Christ. And because of these great truths, we have a firm foundation and the great privilege to go before God, the righteous judge, freely and boldly. More, infinitely more than this widow had to go before an unrighteous judge. The Lord is teaching us on how to pray. What The Lord has taught us how to pray uh, in, in what we call the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer. Um, what we should ask for, our daily bread, uh, forgiveness, uh, deliverance from sin's power, really summed up all that is for life and godliness. When we pray, we don't pray as the world prays. I often hear coworkers when there's an incident and the email goes out, our thoughts and prayers are with you, as if they're thrown out into an empty cosmos with no, no hope for return. That's not the prayer of the elect. We pray in the presence of the Almighty God. We pray in His presence. We must realize this truth. I, my kids go to Coram Deo, in the presence of God. That is how we pray. Coram Deo, in the presence of God. We pray honestly and in humi with humility. That's how we ought to pray. It's illustrated in the next parable with the Pharisee and the tax collector. There's nothing that can be hidden from him. He knows your heart. He knows your grievance. He knows your complaint that you may have toward him. So go to him and him alone with that. One writer says, carry your grievance to the light of his countenance. If you have a charge against him, charge your complaint home to him and him alone. And then listen for his answer. For surely, in gentleness and truth, he will clear himself of the charge of unkindness that you may bring against him. And in his light, you shall see light. But remember that this is a private matter between you and your Lord, and you must not defame him to anyone. So when we pray to him, we can pray. Honestly, he knows your heart. Nothing is hidden before him. And what an encouragement that is for the elect. When we pray, we pray in faith. Contrast the prayer of the, the world and, and hopelessness. Um, we pray in faith. We come to God in faith knowing that he hears and he will answer to his will for our good. This is not how the world prays. With hopelessness as if ringing a bell, plead with me, hear, hear me, here I am, if you're somewhere out there. No, we are in his presence and we pray in faith. And we pray with persistence. This is how we ought to pray with persisting in prayer. We ought to pray in expectation for his answer in his time and wait. One writer said, we should watch daily Continue instant in prayer. Strengthen our supplications with arguments from God's word and promise. And mark how your prayers speed. 
When we shoot an arrow, we look to its fall. When we send a ship to sea, we look for its return. It is atheism to pray and not wait in hope for his answer. George Mueller was a man of prayer. If you've read his biography, autobiography, you see it all throughout. He was a man of prayer. He cast his cares upon the Lord. And in one instance, George Mueller goes on and he says, I myself have continued for 29 years, been waiting for an answer to pray concerning a certain spiritual blessing. Day by day have I been enabled to continue in prayer for this blessing. He doesn't name what that is. At home and abroad, in this country and in foreign lands, in health and in sickness, however much occupied I've been enabled day by day, by God's help, to bring this matter before him. And still I have not the full answer yet. Nevertheless, I look for it. I expect it confidently. The very fact that the day after day and year after year for 29 years, the Lord has enabled me to continue in this prayer patiently and believingly to wait on hope, to wait on him for the blessing still further encourages me to wait on him. And so fully am I assured God hears me about this matter that I have often been enabled to pray him bef- to pray to pray to him beforehand for the full answer which I shall ultimately receive to my prayers on this subject matter. He goes on and he would say, George Mueller would say, it is not enough to pray, nor to pray aright, nor is it enough to continue to pray for a time, but we must pray patiently, believingly, continue in prayer until we obtain an answer. And further, we have not only to continue in prayer until the end, but we have also to believe that God does hear us in faith, And he will answer our prayers. Most frequently, we fail, not continuing in prayer until the blessing is obtained and not expecting the blessing. What is that blessing? What is that blessing? It is whatever is in accordance to God's will, his perfect will for us. That is his good. That is to our best, to our good. Paul prayed earnestly for three times for that thorn of his flesh to be removed. And the blessing was, my grace is sufficient for you. That was the blessing that Paul found. That was the answer. My grace is sufficient for you. And we can be sure that whatever is good for God's elect, they shall have it. For all is theirs to help them in this sojourn of faith. Therefore, if poverty is good, they shall have it. If disdain or grit, if, if disgrace or crosses be good, they shall have them. For all is ours to promote our greatest prosperity. And that is eternity with Christ. This home is not, this world is not our home. We are destined as the elect. And the kingdom of God counted among as sons, a great inheritance. And what a great truth this is. You may know the German hymn writer Samuel Rod- Rodegast. Whate'er my God ordains is right. He never will deceive me. He leads me by the proper path. I know he will not leave me. I take content what he hath sent. His hand can turn my griefs away, and patiently I wait his day. That's the thrust of this text, to wait until his day, his imminent return, and the second return of Christ, his second coming. Luke 18, 8, I tell you that he will bring justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The term son of man should draw our minds back to Daniel chapter 7 in which he points to that second return of Christ in which the son of man is coming. 
And he came upon the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And yet we perceive delay, right? We perceive 2,000 years. When he comes, he will come quickly, in an instant, in a flash. But we perceive slowness. Uh, when he comes, he will come quickly, and he will come in his time. Second Peter chapter 3 speaks of this. The day is unto the Lord uh, in, in context of judgment. But by his word, the present heavens and, the, uh, and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. That's not in context of creation. It's in context of the second coming. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his per promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we are to be praying toward, looking toward. That's the very, one of the very reasons we celebrate the Lord's Supper and remember him until he comes again. Well, we are here. We are sojourners. Uh, in this world, we are in the world, we are not of the world. Uh, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. We have at the chapel elderly, we have widows who may think, There's no, what can I do? I'm useless. I'm a burden. No, you have prayer. We have prayer. We have the almighty God to go before his throne in Christ Jesus and to beseech the just Lord on behalf of the saints. We are called to be prayer warriors, to beseech him, to look to him earnestly and look for his return. That's the hope we have in the person of work of Christ, that we are secure. Look to him in eagerness and anticipation. That's the encouragement. That's the burden. That's the, that's, the not, that's the joy we have and the privilege we have in Christ to be reminded of and to humble ourselves to, to prayer, eagerly looking forward to when Christ will judge and bring forth all his justice and mercy for his elect. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Through 21. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. If we are here this morning and have Christ, we have that assurance and hope of the person and work of Christ. If not, the coming justice of God and his judgment, whether he comes to us to, to judge or we meet him before the throne of God in death, there is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. If you are apart from Christ, you have no mediator, no intercessor, no one to boast your, to proclaim his righteousness for you, for we are all fallen and condemned apart from him. Look to him. Look to Christ and turn to him and find 
the hope and joy that we, will ha- that we have as saints to boldly approach the throne of grace. And if you are here in Christ, what a joy and encouragement that is to the saints. An encouragement, whatever trials we have in this life, it is but momentary in light of what awaits in the person and work of Christ. And we have everything to equip us for life and good godliness. Let us go to him and look to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this truth and we fall, I fall so short of that which I am teaching and yet you are faithful and adequate and uh, we pray that you would encourage the saints, lift up our minds and our eyes to your son, to the person and work of Christ as we go out this week. We pray for uh, peace and deliverance, and we pray that you would bless us with every spiritual blessing in Christ to endure faithfully and joyfully, uh, and that we would be lights to a helpless world and shine the light of the person and work of Christ. We pray that you bless your church this morning. And as we go out from here, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.